The entire nation is becoming alarmed and shocked at the terrifying crimes that are being committed from coast to coast. Magazines are carrying stories and newspapers are writing editorials about the appalling crimes and violence north, south, east and west. Crime in America has increased almost four times as fast as population since 1950. As we enter the fall months, our nation is threatened by the most catastrophic crime wave of all time. Last year, 2,563,000 crimes were committed, which was an increase of 13% over 1955. One of the alarming trends in the crime wave is that the arrest of young people under 18 increased over 17% last year. 46% of the arrests for major crimes were committed by youngsters under 18. This is almost unbelievable. This should shock every American out of his apathy and complacency. As one judge said last week, America is turning into one of the most lawless nations in modern history. However, in many cases, crime and criminal statistics have become so taken for granted that the average person is no longer shocked by the grim stories in our newspapers of murder, rape, and robbery until it happens next door or to our own families. We have either capitulated to what seems to be inevitable or we have become calloused and indifferent toward the moral conditions of our country. In the days of Jesse James, his malefactions made gaudy headlines in the nation's press. But the crimes being committed today would make Jesse James look like a Sunday school teacher in comparison. The most disturbing thing is that relatively few Americans are shocked about this tragic situation. Few of you listening to my voice would even remember some of these headlines this year in 1957. Polio victim murdered by teenage gang. Teenage girl murdered and hidden in thicket. Neighbor kills woman and two tots. Boy kills uncle for thrill. Find woman's head in harbor mystery. Two boys stabbed to death near swimming pool. Multiply these by thousands and you will have the tragic story of American crime in 1957. But murder is not the only form of crime. The dictionary says that a crime is an act committed or omitted in violation of a public law forbidding or commanding it. Lawlessness is evident at every turn. The automobile driver that deliberately breaks the speed law and laughs about it the man who cheats on his income tax, or the thousands who make a quick illegal dollar, the swaggering, defiant labor leaders who created such a shameful spectacle before the McClellan Committee, businessmen who keep to the letter of the law though continually breaking the spirit of it, children that are rebellious against their parents. Crimes in high places prompted by an insane greed are no less evil than murder, robbery, and prostitution. The Hollywood trials have unearthed a cesspool of immorality Yet the people whose names have been dragged into court are not any more guilty than the millions of Americans that buy the lewd trash on many of our newsstands getting a vicarious thrill from the immoral and illicit experiences of others. Dr. Thorsten Selin, our foremost authority on criminal statistics, believes that the word crime wave is meaningless unless the reference is to the big crime wave that began when Cain killed Abel. The truth is, the criminal problem began when man broke fellowship with God and elected to go on his own murderous, lawless, sinful way. The New York Herald Tribune recently said, New York has a crime problem. So has every other big city. And if this alarming growth isn't checked at the beginning, the result may well be that there won't be enough prisons to hold all the criminals. Obviously, the time to act is now. We are treating symptoms in this country and very rarely do we check crime at its source. Society is made up of individuals who have all sinned against God and come short of his glory. Christ said, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man, said Jesus. Jesus taught that the heart of man was wrong, and out of his heart come evil things that spread like a poison through all of society, causing outbreaks of violence, dishonesty, greed, and many times leads to war. What actually are we doing as a nation to stop this tremendous deluge of crime? First, we are compiling crime statistics. Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, in his Uniform Crime Reports, has done an excellent job in alerting the nation as to the seriousness of the crime situation. But this is only diagnostic. It is not curative. Secondly, we are punishing crime insofar as it is possible. 
Though it is estimated that for every criminal that is arrested, three escape. It is also estimated that nine out of every ten murderers in the United States are walking the streets free today. Thirdly, in many cases, we are trying to rehabilitate the criminal and some progress is being made. However, many law enforcement officers are beginning to realize that something else is needed. A police chief said last month that man needs to be reborn. He was far nearer the truth than he knew because Christ said, ye must be born again. Fourthly, we have in almost every city all kinds of organizations to curb or prevent crime. Many of them are doing excellent, thankless jobs. Much of our crime comes from underprivileged areas. We must recognize that crime is a condition of society. We're all in part to blame for crime. Our apathy, our selfishness, our ignorance, all these contribute to the breeding and feeding of crimes. The have-nots steal often because the haves ignore their plight and fail to share their opportunities with the less fortunate. The selfishness of the law-abiding citizen is reflected in the lawlessness of the criminal. Hence, the so-called respectable citizen creates an atmosphere which fosters evil. One famous criminologist says, society has the criminality it deserves. Isaiah the prophet rebuked his nation 800 years before Christ when he said, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. They were not all murderers and doers of violence, but the prophet laid the blame of sin and crime at the door of the whole nation. In other words, all of society is responsible for helping breed conditions that in turn breeds crime. It is time the Christian church wakes up to its responsibility in ever any given community toward the underprivileged, especially in the larger cities where bad housing conditions and lack of recreational facilities oftentimes breeds crimes, especially among our young people. Many Americans are asking, what can we do about this appalling and tragic situation that faces the nation and threatens the very foundation of our society? First, we can recognize who is the author of crime and violence. The Bible teaches that there is a personal devil and that he is the mastermind behind the evil in the world today. In my opinion, there is no explanation for the fantastic and rapid growth of communism. In spite of seeming reverses such as Hungary that should under normal circumstances have turned world opinion against them, they continue to grow at a rapid pace. They outwit Western nations at every turn. Many Bible teachers believe that they're given supernatural power by the devil himself. During the last few years, we have had a great spiritual renaissance in the United States. In fact, 1957 may go down in history as a year of revival. The Bible says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. The opposite could also be said. Where grace abounds, sin does much more abound. When God begins to move in a nation, Satan reacts with violence. Thus, we have a strange paradox in America. We are witnessing a spiritual revival and at the same time unprecedented outbreaks of racial tension, crime, and immorality. What is the explanation? It's very simple. It is Satan's violent reaction to the moving of God's spirit in the nation. The Bible says that men love darkness because their deeds are evil. However, when the searchlight of the gospel is thrown on the denizens of iniquity, they become alarmed and begin to react. Satan is thrashing about and lashing out in every area of American society. He is even attacking Christian leaders. He is causing division and strife in many churches. He is making even Christians jealous of each other. He is spreading lies and using a thousand subtle tricks to destroy the testimony of the gospel in this country. We have felt his pressure more in the last six months than any other period of our ministry. If it had not been for the prayers of the Lord's people concentrating on New York during the last few months, those meetings could have been a complete disaster. It is high time that Christians should realize that we are wrestling not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God does not call us to a playground, but a battlefield. This is a fight to the finish between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. Thanks be unto God, we've been warned by the Holy Scriptures to be on the alert for this dreadful enemy. The Apostle Paul said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 
The Christian is never told to run or to flee from the devil. We are told to submit ourselves unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. We are told again in 1 Peter 5, 9, whom resists steadfast in the faith. We are not only to resist, but we are to be armed against Satan because he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. On another occasion, he becomes an angel of light, subtly deceiving the very elect. Many feel that we are now living at the climax of history. Satan knows that his end is near. His doom is sealed. Thank God the church that is in Christ shall triumph and we shall be victorious. But until then, it is a daily battle, both in our own souls and in the world about us. Secondly, we must repent of our sins as a people. The seeming small, insignificant sins that have created an atmosphere cr for crime. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. He does not weigh our evil nor judge it by degrees. The Bible says if we offend in one point, we are guilty of all. It was the everyday sins that nailed Jesus to the cross. The people who crucified Jesus were not murderers nor thieves. His executioners were envious high priests, dutiful soldiers, and a cross-section of excited average people. But the ignorance, inertia, and indifference of the multitudes created an atmosphere that made possible his death. The average American needs to get down on his knees before God and repent of his average sins, especially the sins of neglect and omission. The renegade, the robber, and the rapist would feel less resentment toward society and crime would be lessened if we were not so guilty of the sins of omission. The words of Isaiah are appropriate for today. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The crime situation in America is appalling, but what alarms me even more is the morals of the average American. Many ministers all over America are expressing grave concern about the shrinking morals of their people. I receive letters every week from Christian leaders who are burdened for their people, who seem to be carried along with the tide of moral corruption. I beg of you, Mr. Average American, repent of your sins. Not only the future of our nation, not only the saving of your home and family, but your own soul's destiny is at stake. For the past few months, God has been knocking loudly at America's door. I have a feeling that the resurgence of faith in some areas of America is perhaps our last chance for us as a nation to make a spiritual decision. The communists are reported to be three years ahead of their schedule in their drive for world conquest. They believe that if they can keep America from practicing what she preaches as a Christian nation, that they can take us over in less than 20 years, and they may be right. Christ's voice is thundering down through the ages. Repent, 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 except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. But don't stop at repentance. There's another important step. Let God change your nature. The world can never be changed until individuals are changed. You can never do right until God puts a right spirit within you, as he did Daniel of old. Multiplied thousands of people during our New York crusade experienced a change of heart through Jesus Christ. You can too. The Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The imputed righteousness in a human heart can do more to change our crumbling morals in our society than all the sociological experiments for human betterment. This is the only way to check evil at its source, for it has its beginning in the human heart. It was on the cross that Jesus Christ died and shed his blood that sin might be forgiven and that men might receive a new heart. You can come today in repentance of your sin and by faith in Jesus Christ who was dying for your sins who rose again for your justification, who is a living Savior at the right hand of God the Father, and he and he alone can give you a new heart and a new spirit and a new moral nature if you will receive him by faith. A habitual criminal in New York writes the other day, in the past six years, I've been arrested four times for various crimes. These were just the times I got caught. Nothing seemed to work. Everything went wrong. Then I came to Madison Square Garden. I came five nights in a row. One night, I walked down the aisle with tears streaming down my face. My whole life is different now. I cannot describe the peace and joy. I have a new power to resist temptation. Next Sunday, I'm joining a church. I'm convinced that I've found a totally new way of life. But like you said, Christ had to change my nature before I could change my way of living. Next, 
Make a full commitment of your life to Christ. Don't be content to be a nominal Christian. I've never heard of a communist who was a nominal communist. They stand ready to die for their ideology, and many of them have. So far, the communists have been winning the world much faster than the disciples of Jesus Christ. I submit to you that the best way to avert crime, to check evil, is for millions of Americans to make a full, unequivocal surrender to Jesus Christ. He is the only way out of the involvement and entanglements of these crisis days. It is imperative that the world be saved for Christianity and that you, wherever you are, declare your allegiance to the one who said, I'm come, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But I'm not asking you to give your life to Jesus Christ just to help save America today, though I believe that is important and imperative and certainly a reason for giving your life to Christ. I'm asking you to give your life to Christ today because he died for you, because he loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible again says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Whoever you are, God loves you. He is willing to forgive the past. He is willing to change your life and give you a new life for the future. And the moment you die, your spirit goes straight into the presence of Christ and you spend eternity in heaven. That can happen to you today by giving your life to Jesus Christ. That will save your soul, but it will also please God the Father. The Bible says when one sinner repents, it causes rejoicing in heaven. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many men and women today all over the world that have heard this broadcast will surrender their lives to the Savior. We pray that thou wouldst bless America today, bless this great nation and give it the moral strength and wisdom to lead the free world at this critical period. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.